stand to your feet with us? We're going to go ahead and get started in some songs this morning.
just learn more about you, but to proclaim who you are to our city, to our community. We lift you high this morning, and we thank you for your amazing grace, and that you came down to us. There's no way, there's no ladder we could ever climb, no ladder of good works to get to you. And even now, the grace that we have, it's not based on what we do. You love us, even in our worst day. You couldn't be more crazy about us. Help us to respond to that, that love, that amazing grace by remaining in you, the true vine. Be the strength of our life. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Well, hi, friend. Remember me? I've worked hard to make sure you never forget. That's the beauty of our relationship. You make mistakes, I watch and laugh, and then I remind you about them over and over and over. Oh, <laughs> speaking of which, remember that project you totally dropped the ball on at work and then blamed it on the new guy, Jerry? Man, did he ever cry when they escorted him out of the building. The upside is that that's a Christmas his family will never forget, and it's all thanks to you. Speaking of never forget, wanted to remind you, you're the worst. No, 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 don't try to argue with me, Dr. Phil. You are not defined by your guilt. <sighs> uh, yes, you are. I'm guilt, I just defined you, boom. And it's not my fault. You're the one whose own sister won't even talk to you. Man, <laughs> bet you wish you could take those uh, words back, huh? Just had to speak your mind, didn't you? Look, bottom line, You've done some bad stuff, and you should always remember that. And if you don't, I've got your back. Don't worry, he's got your back. So uh, I, I, I would ask you to raise your hand if you've ever had thoughts of guilt and that type of thing, but everybody thank you for raising your hands so, <laughs> but uh, i said I, i'm not going to so anyways but because uh, i know i know everyone here has had thoughts of guilt has had conversations with guilt so uh, i know how i know the score of all that uh i lived a life that i even now at uh my age i think back and i have sometimes I have a conversation with guilt sometimes now it's not a very long conversation now because I've asked forgiveness I've I've repented I've so it's not a very long conversation but nonetheless guilt uh, guilt uh, visits all of us with conversation so we are in a series called smooth criminals it's a series about four deceptive enemies of the heart that left unchecked. They will rob us of many good things in our lives. Because like this guy uh, representing guilt, he just keeps coming many times. So, uh, please open your heart today and see if we can identify one of them together. One of these deceptive enemies uh, called smooth criminals and it's called guilt today so anyways we're gonna try that we're gonna uh, talk about that today so let's have a word of prayer and just open up that way then we will jump right in so father I ask you I ask you as you've already begun with me to think through and and hear and I ask you folks uh, father for uh, those even listening at home to open their hearts and just hear, open their ears and hearts to hear about this guilt thing that keeps many, many people from living the life that you have called them to live. I ask you to help us today, help us to see that. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. Guilt says that you've done something You've done some really bad stuff. That's what guilt says. You've done some really bad stuff. Uh, and I'll always be there 
to remind you. Signed guilt. That's a guilt says. Sign guilt. Yeah. So now and then, I'm, I want to say there's some um, uh, worship notes for you if you'd like to take some notes. So now and then, we all can hear the voice of guilt in our minds. It's just I know that we can. Uh, some are better at it than others, uh, but uh, but blocking out the voices and not hearing them. But many people, many, in fact, all now and then hear the voice of guilt. Did any of you know that since 1811, now I said 1811, the Department of Treasury has kept a fund called the Conscience, Conscience Fund. The Conscience, like your conscience. Uh, conscience Fund. It was started for people who defrauded the government to make monetary restitution for what they have done in life. It's the... Uh, uh, a monetary restitution fund. It's called the Conscious Fund. So people have sent money to this fund and many times included a note to explain uh, why they're sending money to this fund. So many would remain, in fact, almost everybody remains anonymous when they send this, uh, this fund. So, but when those pangs of guilt hit, Many people send money to the conscience fund. They just do. They send and kind of make it right. Right now, the conscious fund, uh, the government treasury conscious fund, has $4 million in it. That's the last time I checked. It was a while ago. So anyways, it has $4 million in it. One person listed some of the notes written by guilt-ridden citizens. They kept track of some of the notes. And one note was written, email, and it says, please accept the money enclosed for two postage stamps I reused. Uh, they were already expired and maybe they didn't have those black marks on it. And so they just reused them. <laughs> they got one over. They got one over on the uh, post office. But uh, it's kind of funny sometimes to think about that. Uh, uh, about someone would send that. But anyways, another guilty person wrote this. Please accept the check for $1,300. It's restitution for tools. Leave days that I misused and other things that I stole while I was in the army. So this person made it right uh, to the uh, conscience fund. And then one person fessed up to taking two metal office dividers from the government office that he worked. He said, I ask you to forgive me, and I am extremely sorry for this theft. And he sent some money to, uh, to pay for the dividers. And then my favorite is this. It's kind of confusing, but it's, it's my favorite. <laughs> it's from a man who wrote a note to the IRS wrote a note to the IRS, and then he put, a, put this note in with his money uh, that he's paying back. The note said this, I've not been able to sleep. I've not been able to sleep, so here's $100 that I owe you. P.S. If I'm still not able to sleep, I'll send you the rest. <laughs> I was a little confused on that one. So, so uh, there's something called, honestly, folks, there's something called good guilt, and uh, that might help if you have sin in your life. Good guilt. Many call it. Uh, many call it conviction. If you have sin in your life, it's they're like interchangeable. But good guilt. If there's sin in your life and God convicts your heart. Many call that good guilt, and some call it conviction. So, conviction by the Spirit of God. So, uh, good guilt motivates us to make things right with God and with others. Good guilt. It motivates that and, and pricks our heart in that way. Uh, good guilt does that. There's also bad guilt. Bad guilt. Uh, bad guilt is when Satan holds you hostage over your past that you've been forgiven of already. Bad guilt. It just keeps coming. 
And you have to discern the two, good guilt and bad guilt, because uh, bad guilt can ruin your day quite often. Bad guilt. But uh, stuff that you've been forgiven for, Satan has the ability to just keep reminding you about certain things. Reminding you that uh, what you did. Bad guilt makes you feel like you could never, like God could never love you. God could never love you because of what you've done. Bad guilt. Bad guilt. We've also had various, I know we've, uh, probably most of us, have had various conversations with guilt. Good and bad. We've had conversations that way. It's Satan's oldest way to hurt us conversations about our guilt guilt is happy it is so happy to dig up your past and then throw it back in your face guilt is happy to do that guilt is a really smooth criminal in our life if you let it bad guilt comes to steal your faith and replace it with your failures it keeps track of all your failures, bad guilt. Keeps track of all your failures, what you said and didn't follow through with, what just all the failures. And when you get older, you just have a good long line on the list of those. And bad guilt has, a, has the ability to just keep clubbing you with those type of things. If bad guilt is not dealt with, it will change you and turn your life ugly. Turn your life ugly. There's a man in the Old Testament who struggled with guilt. He really struggled with guilt. His name is King David. That guy in the Old Testament. King David. 2 Samuel tells his story in chapter 11 and chapter 12 of 2 Samuel. So if you have your Bibles or tablets or whatever, would you please turn there? Uh, we're going to just pause there for a second. But... And then we're going to jump to Psalms 51. So anyways, if you just think about that. King David in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 12. It tells us where his guilt originated. If you've never read that story, it's quite an interesting story. In fact, it was hard for me to get past what David did. Think about that until I started looking at my own sin. And then I said, okay. Okay, even Stephen. So, but nonetheless, one night, David couldn't sleep. This is how the story goes. One night, David couldn't sleep, and he went out on, a, on, on his palace balcony. The palace balcony was one that it really did. It overlooked Jerusalem because he's the king. He gets the best balcony and the best place to live. So, it overlooked most of Jerusalem. As he looked, he saw a beautiful woman bathing. Now, most guys, I would think, uh, honorable men would maybe go back inside, or, but uh, uh, many men would continue to look and think, uh, hubba, bubba, bubba. And, uh, but uh, nonetheless, he looked and saw a beautiful woman bathing. He found out who she was and sent servants to bring her to the palace. Sent service to bring her to the palace. He committed adultery with her. He thought everything was going to be fine and no one would ever know. Did you ever hear those last famous words? No one will ever know. No one will ever know. I've said those things. No one will ever know. And I'm the one that lets and eventually lets a cat out of the bag. I've said those about myself and no one will ever know. And then, and then for whatever reason, guilt and just... It bothers me, and, and then I tell somebody, and you ruin it there. No one will ever know if you just keep your yapper shut. No one will many times ever know, but I couldn't even keep my yapper shut on myself. So, uh, he thought no one would ever know. But in a few weeks, this girl that had sex with David, uh, she sent word to David that she was pregnant. She was pregnant. David now had a choice to make. He's in a pickle here, and not too much. He's a king, and you know, they can cover all kind of things when you're a king. But David had a choice to make. Cover it all up, 
or fess up. Fess up to it. He had a choice to make. He chose to cover it up. That's what David did. He chose to cover it up. This pregnant girl Bathsheba was married to a man by the name of Uriah. Anybody that knows the scripture a little bit, you kind of have read this. And his name, her husband was named Uriah. Uriah was a soldier and he was fighting for King David's army. He was in the army. He was fighting on the side of King David for Jerusalem, for King David, Uriah was. And he was out to battle. That's why Bathsheba was alone. So, so David is, she's pregnant now. So David's a pretty smart guy. He came up with a plan to cover his sin, to cover what he had done. She's pregnant. So he came up with a plan. He said, call Uriah back from the battle and I'll meet with him. And I'll talk to him about how the battle is going, how uh, Joab, the commander, how do you think he's doing as a leader? And uh, so he called him back and just, how's the battle front? Give me some sort of assessment. So he calls Uriah back and he does. And he asks Uriah and, and Uriah gives him some sort of assessment, how he thinks. Uh, Uriah responds with information with information how he thinks the battle is going. Then David did this. All in his plan, he got Uriah drunk. He said, no, have another one. <laughs> hey, no, you're a good man. And let's have another one together. And, and uh, your family's great and you're great and everybody's great. Cheers to Uriah. As David dismissed Uriah that night, this is what David did. He suggested that Dave, that Uriah go back to see his wife. She maybe lives 10 blocks from the, from the palace. And uh, go back and see your wife. You know, go back and just say hi to her. And uh, David had plans like, uh, no, go back and have sex with her. Wink, wink, nod, nod. Go back and you can have a night with your wife. And especially because he knew who Bathsheba was. He knew she was a beauty. And you and, and he knew very possibly Uriah is going to head on back to Bathsheba. So many men would run home and quickly visit their wife. So they would. They just would. But Uriah didn't. He slept on the palace steps. If you know the story, you know this guy slept on the palace steps and didn't return home. <laughs> David said, this guy's, this guy's drunk, Uriah's drunk. David got him drunk. And he said, no, go back home and see your wife. And Uriah, think about that. Uriah didn't go back. He stayed around the palace. Uh, David heard this. And the next day called Uriah in and said, what's wrong with you, man? Why didn't you go back and see your wife? What is wrong with you? Uriah said, King, how can I do that when other soldiers don't have the same opportunity? How could I take that pleasure? Honestly, right there, my heart dropped whenever I heard those things about Uriah. That speaks volumes about that man's heart. He said, how could I do that when the other men are out of battle? They don't have opportunity. I cannot take that pleasure. So that's why I slept on the palace steps. I can't enjoy privilege when others do not have the same privilege. So please note this, Uriah is more honorable drunk then David is sober. So you can't really say all drunks are idiots because Uriah really had a, some kind of moral code, working honorable code working with him. So at least at this point of the story, that be true, that be true. David then writes a message. So that plan failed, that stinks. Uh, so 
that plan fails, then David writes a message because he has to take it up a notch now. He writes a message. This is another reason. This is a foul, foul, harsh, hideous message that David writes, King David in the palace. He writes a message that no one else sees, makes it a private king's message to Joab, the commander. He writes that, seals it, and says, Uriah, I want you to take this message to the commander Joab. So, the note said this, because we know someone was honest here and wrote and told us what the message was. The message said this to Uriah the commander. He said, put Uriah at the front where the fighting is the most harsh. Put Uriah at the front where the fighting is the most harsh then withdraw the troops so Uriah will be struck down. Now I'm telling you, that's what scripture says. That's not what, I just didn't put a fancy tail ending on that and just to make it juicy. That's what the scripture says. It is disgusting to read the backstab that took place there. So Uriah, takes his own message of doom, unbeknownst to him, back to his commander, Joab. Loyalty to David, loyalty to Joab, and he takes this message back to Joab. It's, it's beyond the pale. The plan unfolds, and Uriah dies. It happened, and Uriah dies. David thinks, <laughs> this is what David had to have thought now, I'm home free. After a time of mourning and uh, fake sadness, because you have to fake sadness. You have to act like you're broken hearted. I, uh, you know, I, I, know how to, I know how to fake things, really I do. I know how to, if you live any long at all, I know you're adults, you know how to fake things. David did too. So he faked mourning. He's the one that caused it all. He faked like he was mourning after a certain time. And Bathsheba comes to, uh, comes and marries David. And they all live happily ever after. They all live happily ever after. No, not true. Not true. Enter Nathan, the respected prophet of God. Enter Nathan. Someone, someone that was willing just to speak a word of truth in the middle of all this insanity. And ever, you know, the, the most hated person of all then is Nathan the prophet. Because he speaks the word of truth. Did you ever tell the truth? on something and somehow some way you tell the truth and then people look at you like you're a monster for telling the truth so it is with nathan so it is with nathan he's a respected prophet of god nathan publicly now this was big stuff nathan publicly calls out david for his adultery with Bathsheba. Calls out David for his adultery with Bathsheba. For what he has done here. He tells this whole story that God spoke to him to tell. At some point, David is cut to the heart. He tells that Nathan is telling this story. And I, I don't really know. It doesn't tell us the narrative like David is maybe listening yes go on it's a nice story of a sheep he had you know he had this and had that and and this just was a young man and and he just had a few sheep and some powerful man came and took his sheep and david said yes oh th that's bad that powerful man took that one sheep 
That's bad. Tell me who this, this, this powerful man is and we'll put him in his place. We'll square up with him. This powerful man. And Nathan the prophet said, Thou art the man. Now, sometimes that would been, have been the end of Nathan. Because after you point the finger in the king's face, or even after you point the finger in someone else's face, and said, no, you're the one that did this. Now, people have lost their jobs over that. People have been hurt. Friendships broken. Because you spoke up and said, no, you're the one that did this. It's too harsh for our society. You have to fake it and act like we don't really know who did it. You have to fake it. That's what our society, that's what the world does many times. They fake it. So, anyways. So, Nathan said, thou art the man. David, you are the man. At some point, David is cut to the heart. He is. He's cut to the heart. He's embarrassed now. And then there's regret. He actually, I was glad he came to that. And then he came to regret. He just, it, it hit him like a load of bricks fell on him. After Nathan said and described this sad story about this lamb, this guy and his lamb. He goes, no, David, you're the man that I'm describing. And so David's cut to the heart. What began with lust and desire, and it's so fun. Lust and desire is so fun. Uh, we won't even proceed with that one because all of you know what, uh, well, most of you would anyways, uh, know what lust and desire is. It takes you places. Oh, because it is so fun, lust and desire. This started with lust and desire, looking over the balcony, woo, woo, whoa, oh, goodness. And then most of us don't have power to send our servants to go do our dirty work for us. So, but David did. What began with lust and desire moved to adultery, then deceit, and then the end cap of murder. The end cap of murder. Now, yours and my, yours and my sequence of sin, the way things happen in our life, we're not, we're not in that king's sequence. We're just not. I'm just as sneaky as David. In my heart of hearts, I have done several sneaky, very sinful things. But the sequence, mine and your sequence of sin, is different than David's. And it is different. All of ours are different. The sequence of how things happen. But sin, 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 it all begins in the heart. It all begins in the heart. Get last week's message on podcast. It'll speak to that. Last week we talked about that. So, in order for sins to be forgiven, in order for sins to be forgiven and guilt to be erased, there has to be spiritual surgery. There has to be spiritual surgery. A Hershey med surgeon can't help you with this unless he's a Christ follower and tells you this. But there has to be uh, uh, spiritual surgery. So let's look at this journey David took to overcome this smooth criminal called guilt because he was in a load of trouble. David was. So turn to Psalms chapter 51 in your Bibles or phones. Psalms 51, David truly repents here. Psalms 51, Psalms 51, then notice how King David responded when he was confronted by his sin. This was a psalm that David wrote after he was confronted with his sin and after he was cut to his heart uh 
Anyone can respond in the same way that David did in this passage. And if you are ever looking for, for a pattern, and ever looking for something to go by, this is excellent. I have used this to fess up the things. I've used this. It's just perfect. In your, in your notes, uh, number one in your notes, the number one thing he did, and, 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 and we notice about this passage, is remorse. David had remorse, deep regret for a wrong that he committed, deep regret for a wrong that we've committed, deep regret, not that you got caught, but deep regret for the wrong that you have committed. Psalm 51 verse 1 and 2, it says this, verse 1 and 2 says, have mercy on me, O God, that's what David writes. O oh God, according to your unfailing love, according to your great compassion, blot out my transgressions, wash away all my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. So David writes, as so David did, when remorse is present, when real remorse is present, our heart is broken for what we've done. Heart is broken for what we've done. The Bible says that Godly sorrow leads to life. Godly sorrow. It leads to life. Remorse reveals that uh, we're sorry for the choices or the choice that we made. Remorse. Parents see the opposite in kids many times. They see the opposite. I mean, a parent will see it in their kids. Ralphie, I saw what you did. Tell your brother you're sorry for hitting him, him for hitting him with that Louisville slugger. <laughs> Ralphie, tell him. Ralphie. All right, I'm going to count to three. You better tell him. Ralphie. Sorry. Sorry. Okay. Now, Johnny, did is that good enough? Because Ralphie told you he was sorry. Listen, it doesn't take a child psychologist to discern that Ralphie isn't really sorry for hitting Johnny with the bat. Sorry! Ralphie is just sorry because he's in serious hot water. He's in serious hot water because he left a massive welt on Johnny. Johnny. So, he's sorry. Uh, he's sorry that he's in hot water. How about a, an expense report? Some of you that do those things, maybe you exaggerated on your expense report. Maybe you did. So you exaggerated on your spend, expense report and you thought it would slide by. Honestly, you thought the, that boss is so busy, he's underwater. I can add this, 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 this. And honestly, uh, why not? It's free money. <laughs> it's free money. <laughs> the boss caught it. The boss caught what you did, caught this exaggeration or caught what you put on your expense report. Then what do you say? Maybe you say this. Well, I'm not, I'm not sure how that got there. I'm not sure how that got there. No, why do you look at me that way? I'm not sure how that got there. Uh, or this. You know what? I was wrong to even put that on there. I'm very, very sorry for that. I'm the one that exaggerated that. Uh, and I apologize for that. Folks, remorse is a good place to start. Remorse is a good place to start, but it should lead us to area number two in your notes. Number two, confession. It should lead us, if you truly have remorse, it should lead to confession. It's like the next step. After remorse leads to confession, admission that one is guilty of doing wrong. Admission that one is, that you're guilty of doing wrong. You fess up. You fess up. You're guilty. You take ownership. You did it. You did it. I wonder how many of us are familiar with fessing up like that. I don't even want to show a hands because 
honestly, there was times in my life that I covered things and, you know, or early on. And there are times in my life that I fessed up big time. But notice what David says in Psalms 51 verse 3. He says, I know my transgressions. David fesses up. I know my transgressions and my sin is always before me says against you you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight that's what he says that's what David says he fesses up he fesses up folks there's power in confession power in confession and but our tendency is to rationalize and make excuses that's the tendency David could have easily rationalized and made excuses. Listen, folks, he was the king. You can do all kind of things. You got all kind of play and leeway there. If you're the king, he could have rationalized and made excuses. He could have said, listen, Uriah was at war. He was going to be killed anyways. That's just the casualty of war. And I was just helping out a young woman that she's going to be tore up in the heart because he's going to die at war anyways. He could have said that, and a lot of people would have just bought it. If he'd have been on CNN, they could have interviewed him, and people would have said, oh, my goodness, he's such a nice man that he felt bad for Uriah, even though he had Uriah killed. But no one knows that. No one knows that. So I just helped you out a young woman. Look how nice he is. He's helping out that young woman. He didn't even know her. And he's helping her out. Listen, but David fessed up. David fessed up and took ownership. Ownership. Number three in your notes. David then makes a request. In this Psalm 51, David makes a request. Psalm 51, verse 9, 10, 12, and 14. In 9, he says... David says this, the request, hide your face from my sins. He's talking to the Lord here. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquity. David asks for forgiveness. He's ashamed. He's ashamed of what he has done. Verse 10, he said, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit in me. Listen, David asks for renewal here. Asks for things to be clean with you, O oh God. And then verse 12, he said, Restore to me the joy of your salvation, Lord, and grant me a willing spirit to, and, uh, to sustain me. David asked to be restored. He asked to be restored. Key points. If you're, listen, if you're underwater with guilt and have done something, I say go home and get these things out. And walk through, don't live another day underwater with guilt. Lastly, he asked for deliverance. And then verse 14, he asked for deliverance. He said, save me from blood guilt. And this means, I looked it up, and it's killing Uriah. Killing Uriah. That wasn't like adultery. He killed a man over this. He said, save me from blood guilt, O God. The God who saves me and my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Please save me from that. That guilt that I'm going to have to live with. So he took ownership of killing Uriah. In your notes, we see remorse, confession, and request. But there's one more thing, honestly, still missing, and it's probably the most important thing. One more thing still missing, but it's probably the most important thing. Number four in your notes, repentance. Repentance. Folks, I can't tell you how many things that I've regretted. It's more than I could count the things that I've regretted in my life. The things I've stolen. Huh loads drunk and driving I've drive I've drove drunk I'm not talking about last week 
I'm talking about years gone by. I've, dr I've driven drunk about a hundred times in my life. And I think of the possibility, what could possibly have happened, somehow, some way, God protected me. The idiot that I was driving drunk. It will ruin your life and possibly other, <coughs> li other lives. So, uh, things that I've, I've regretted, driving drunk, things that I've said, people that I've hurt in this life, Listen, a smart mouth will get you in all kinds of hot water. Someone would say, I wish I was as clever as you, or I wish I could come back like you. You do not even be blessed with being stunned how to come back. Because you don't have to apologize the next 5,000 years for all the idiotic things you've said is just fly into my mouth, fly into my brain and fly out of my mouth. I've had to work serious on that because it just comes. And then I have to decide in a split second whether I'm going to say that or not. Because it'll hurt, and it'll be unkind, and it'll divide people. So, uh, some would say, well, I wish I was like that. No, you don't even. Even, I know you want to have answers, but I had smart, foul answers. Smart, foul answers. But until I repented, these things just kept happening. Until I repented. Listen, number four, repentance. It's the fourth piece of the puzzle. If you're ever going to experience freedom from guilt, there has to be repentance. Has to be. In your notes, it's a change of heart and a change of direction. Repentance. A change of heart and a change of direction. David said this in, in verse 13 and 17. Uh, he said, this is what I'll do. There was a change of heart and direction. David said in verse 13, then I will teach your ways to rebels, Lord, and they will return to you because a change has taken place in my heart. I'm gonna teach your ways to rebels and to have them, and, and maybe that'll cause them to return to you. And he said in verse 17, the sacrifice you desire, Lord, is a broken spirit from me. That's the sacrifice you desire. You will not reject a broken, a broken and repentant heart, O oh Lord. He said, that's the change God's looking for. A broken, broken heart. Listen, God my desire to show people the path my desire now is to show people the path to you that's my desire show people the path that i've that i've chosen the path that i finally finally found that's what david tells god in this prayer maybe he maybe we could say this maybe we could say this maybe you at home could say think about something like this I'm brokenhearted over what I said to you. I'm brokenhearted over what I said to you. I really am. I don't want to lose you as a friend. I'm brokenhearted over that. Please give me another chance to show you I can change. Or how about this? Please forgive me. Please forgive me for my dependence on alcohol. I know, I know I've been tangled with it for quite some time. My dependence on alcohol, I'm calling today change of heart. I'm calling today and I'm going into a program to get myself free. I'm going to start today. Listen, all of us have junk in our closet. Guilt has a way. Guilt has a way of giving junk a voice guilt it's a twisted concept but it has a way of giving giving uh guilt a voice giving the junk in our closets listen david repented and then proved his repentance by the choices he made next and so should we repent and change our choices 
repent, change. Repent means a turning. Psalm 51 was written while David was in the pits in the process of repenting and fessing up. Psalm 51 was written at that. Then I want you to turn to Psalms 32. I know 32 is, is before 51, but these Psalms were not placed in the order that they were written, like uh, chronologically, like when they happened. So that's why Psalm 32 is before 51. It was just thrown in there because it was an excellent Psalm. But anyways, Psalm 32, it was written after David repented. God brought David out of the other side and free from guilt because he repented and uh, asked for forgiveness. In your notes, this is how God responded in Psalm 32. Please know that 51 was sad and full of frustration and repentance. Psalms 32 is full of upbeat and freedom after he repented. So, when guilt is gone, folks, freedom flourishes. Amen. It does when guilt is gone. So, just hear what David said after he responded, after he repented and God set him free. Think about this. It says in verse 1, it says, Oh, what joy to those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who whose record the Lord has cleared of guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. When I refused to confess my sin, David writes, my body wasted away, and I groaned all day long. Things were a mess. It says, day and night your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in summer heat. Uh, and this is interlude, but it says, finally I confessed all my sin to you, and stop trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord. And then you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Folks, I, I tell my story sometimes to people, and they're just wondering, well, buddy, you can't just walk away from that crap. You did what you did. And I said, yes, I did. Yes, I did, but my God has forgiven me. My God has forgiven me, and even bigger than that now, I've accepted his forgiveness. I am free. I am free. Psalms 51, or 32, was written after David repented. God brought David out the other side free from guilt. Listen, in your notes, in your notes, one of the last things, uh, somewhat the last thing, not even last, but one of the last things, God removed both David's sin and his guilt. God removed that. Then, folks, that in and of itself is a wonderful thing, in and of itself. He doesn't just forgive our sin. He also neutralizes the negativity of the even bigger giant guilt if you'll fess up he'll neutralize that big old giant guilt can drag on for years and it does i know people guilt drags on for years god can remove our guilt today today i realize that i'm talking to folks most folks believe the miracle is recorded in scripture most folks believe that, 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 that they believe them. No question that God created or that God sent a flood. No question about that. Or that God raised his son from the dead. No, you know, I'm talking to people that believe that. Even you at home, many of you believe that. We believe it all except one. Except one. This is so hard to believe. That God can forgive and forget. If you read the scriptures, you know he says he'll take your sin and bury it as far as the east is from the west. God can forgive and forget. Last page. Folks, I have three scriptures, then we'll close. Three scriptures, then we'll close. Romans chapter 8, verse 1. 
It says, therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. He has forgiven us. If you fessed it up, he's forgiven us. 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone, if anyone is in Christ, in Christ, he is a new creation. The old is gone and the new has come. And then lastly, it's this. Galatians 2.20. He said, I have been crucified with Christ, Paul says, and I no longer live. I no longer live, but Christ lives in me. The life I live in the body, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. So, somehow you think that you're the exception to God's forgiveness. Somehow we do that math sometimes. And we say that we're the exception. God can't forgive and forget. We're the exception. I know he does it for others, but not me. One last takeaway in your notes at the bottom. One last takeaway. Please know this. When you give Jesus your heart, when you give Jesus your heart, he gives you his. When you give Jesus your heart. That was the only hope I had. When you give Jesus your heart, he gives you his. A brand new heart. You're not stuck with all the old junk. I know you're going to have to fess up and maybe talk to some people. And I did. I talked to lots of people. But he gave me a new heart and a new way of living. Put guilt in its place. Or that smooth criminal will club you, will club you for the rest of your life. Put guilt in its place. The end. Let's pray. Father. I thank you. I thank you for how you went to the cross and provided a way for each and every one of us in spite of what we have done. If we will repent, you will forgive. You forgave David the murderer because you can forgive and you have forgiven. And you forget it, Lord, never to bring it up again. Thank you for that. I ask you, Lord, with the many here today and the ones at home, even this time, it'd be a great time, Lord, to fess up. Even as we take these words home with us, it would be a great time to fess up and rid ourselves of that smooth criminal that claws at us. I ask you to do that. Follow David's lead in Psalm 51 and then rejoice with David in Psalms 32. Please do that, Lord. Help us to be with the courage to do that for ourselves. I ask you to do that. In Jesus' name I pray.
your spirit in our lives, that we would recognize that where we are weak, we are actually strong because of you. Help us to boast in that, like the Apostle Paul says, I will boast in Christ and Christ alone. I thank you, Lord, this morning for the chance to gather with brothers and sisters in Christ and to raise your name high. We love you. We bear witness to you and your power to save. Amen. All right, thank you. You guys are dismissed. If anybody has a prayer request or if you are burdened by something, we encourage you that to come and, and practice confession and receive.